Our theory begins with two important words, acquisition and learning. We think, as you may have heard, people have two different ways of getting better in language. You can acquire language, you can learn language, and they're really different, and this is the fundamental concept. Once this one is understood, everything else follows. Acquisition, we sometimes call the natural way, and the synonym for acquisition is picking up a language. I was in Korea for a couple of weeks and I picked up some Korean. That really means you acquired it. We think acquisition is subconscious, and this really means two things. It means, first of all, while you're acquiring, you don't know you're acquiring, you think you're doing something else. You think you're having a conversation, reading a book, of course you are. But at the same time, without realizing it, you might be acquiring. Also, once you're finished acquiring, you're not always aware that anything has happened. The knowledge is represented subconsciously in your brain. Here's an example. Let's say you hear someone make a mistake in English. Has this ever happened to you? Yes. Thank you. Please say yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, when you hear someone make a mistake in English, can you always tell exactly what rule was broken? Say no. Not no. every time. <laughs> Not every time. Not every time. I can't either. I'd say about 90, 95% of the time I can tell you what rule was broken, but about 5% of the time, 10%, I have a feeling something was wrong, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Certainly. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, that's what we're talking about, a feeling for correctness. We think the ability to subconsciously pick up language is with us our entire life. It never goes away. Children acquire first language, children acquire second language, teenagers acquire, grown-ups acquire, everybody acquires. The ability to subconsciously pick up language does not disappear at puberty, does not disappear with your midlife crisis, does not disappear when you retire. It goes on and on. I've been very interested in language acquisition among old people lately. I don't know why, but I'm happy to know that it continues. The other process is learning. Acquisition is subconscious. Learning is conscious. Learning is what we did in school. Learning in everyday language, when we talk about rules, when we talk about grammar, we're talking about conscious learning. The theory is that error correction helps learning. You make a mistake, someone corrects you, you change your idea of what the rule is. That's how it works in theory. We'll see if the research doesn't shows that it's a very limited process. Now, the next question is, how do we use acquisition and learning? And the easy way to get yourself in the mood for this is to think about what happens to you when you try to speak another language, a language that you don't speak very well. That, I assume, for all of you, is a third or fourth language. Okay? So there you are, struggling through a conversation in what? Korea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In my case, it's Spanish. Spanish is my intermediate language at the moment. I hope it will move up. Uh, and I can barely get through a conversation with it. There you are speaking intermediate Spanish, or Korean, or French. Unfortunately, the other person is generally speaking real Spanish or French. Mark Twain said that when he went to Europe, when he went to France, he had studied intermediate French when he got to Paris, he found he was the only one there who spoke that dialect. That's the situation here. Here's what we think is going on. When you can come out with a sentence easily and fluently in your intermediate language, it comes from what you've acquired. Okay, that's a loudspeaker. Um, all the rules that you learned in school do only one thing for you. They act as a monitor or an editor. So here's learning here. Uh, you're about to say something in your intermediate language. The sentence pops into your head. Just before you speak it, just before you produce it, you think of the rules that you learned in school and you make corrections. Or you blurt it out, realize you made a mistake, you go back and correct. Uh, let me assure you, this is a serious research hypothesis, and it comes from studies we did back in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, and if you want to look at that research, I strongly recommend a book, which is on my website, you can get it for free, uh, called Second Language Acquisition and Second Language Learning. 
Uh, you can look at that. That's where all the data is. I also refer to this book as the cure for insomnia. So if you're having trouble drifting off, pick up this book. It'll do the trick, I'm sure, because all the studies and data are there. Well, rather than go through the research, let me share with you what my thoughts were back in 1975, when it first occurred to me that this is what was going on. I discovered all this when I was three years old. It's true. <laughs> anyway, here's what we th I thought was going on. We, the pedagogical implications. We have acquisition, and I decided acquisition gives us our fluency. We have learning, and I decided that learning gives us our accuracy. Isn't that nice? Isn't that satisfying? And we want both. We want our students to speak easily and fluently, but we also want the grammar to be there. We don't want a grammarless pigeon language. What I decided then is what we need is a balanced program. Two days a week acquisition, two days a week learning. Two days a week conversation, two days a week grammar. Doesn't that sound fair? Doesn't that sound reasonable? The truth must be somewhere in the middle. It turns out it's wrong. It's all wrong. What the research has been telling me, again, every day, no matter where you look, you come back to this. The action is with acquisition. Acquisition gives you fluency and accuracy. Even for the most analytic thinking, grammar-loving adult, it's at least 95% acquisition. For the child, it's 100%. And I should also tell you this. No one was more disappointed to discover this than me. I told you a few moments ago, I have a PhD in grammar. It's right there in linguistics. Until 1975, grammar was my life. <laughs> I love grammar. I can't tell you how much I love grammar. Ever open a good grammar book? <laughs> and look at the verb conjugations. I think they're beautiful. <laughs> My idea of a good time is to find a grammar of a language I don't know, see how they do relative clauses. <laughs> For many years, still my hero, Noam Chomsky. From 1973 to 1975, I was director of ESL at Queens College in New York, and I told my students, I told my teachers, here are the universals of language teaching. Explain the rules clearly and correct errors. I wrote several papers saying that. They were published in the best journals. They're all wrong. A lot of people that think that was my best work. Anyway, you're listening to a convert today, and it's the research that's changed my position. It's acquisition that counts, not learning. It's There's nothing wrong with learning. I would never say, teach grammar, go to jail. I'm not opposed to teaching grammar. My point is, it's limited. It's extremely limited. If you want to use the conscious grammar, three important conditions have to be met. Number one, you have to know the rule. That's hard. Let me illustrate in a couple of ways how hard it is to know the rule. Take your pens that you're uh, scribbling with and draw a, a circle about the size of a large coin. Let's pretend this circle is all the rules of English. English is a language we know the most about and has had the most research. And let's say we go to the world's greatest syntacticians. The world's greatest syntactician, of course, is Noam Chomsky. And Chomsky has spent all his life either doing radical politics or looking for new generalizations of English. Chomsky knows more about English than anyone alive, more than anyone who has ever lived. And if you ask him, how have we done here in English, how many rules do we have, he'd say, we've only described fragments. But let's give him a lot of credit. Let's say Chomsky has described this many rules of English. Give him credit. You can draw a circle like that. Now, the other circles are going to be up to you. Let's draw another circle. We say in math, proper subset. that represents all the rules the authors of grammar textbooks know. These are the applied linguists, we call them. What they do is they read Chomsky's reports and try to put them in the book. So draw a circle for them. Give them a lot of credit. Okay. Now, another circle, all the rules 
the best grammar teachers teach. You got another one? Give them credit. They don't teach all the rules that are in all books. Now, another circle, all the rules the best students learn. Now, another circle, all the rules the best students remember. <laughs> and now, another circle, all the rules the best students learn, remember, and can actually use. You can't use a lot of them, they're too complicated. Uh, for example, the rule for the tag question in English, John is a boy, isn't he? Let's say you're an intermediate ESL person and you're trying to use this rule in conversation. Oh my gosh. Okay, John is a boy. If, there's a, 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 if the subject is a regular noun, you drop it, you put in a pronoun. If it's a pronoun, you keep the pronoun. They look at the verb. Regular verb, you drop the verb, put in a helping verb. If it's a helping verb already, you just use that. Uh, if the sentence is positive, you make the tag negative. The sentence is negative, you make the tag positive. And you change the word order. By the time you do that, your conversational partner is long gone. <laughs> the little dot you have in the middle is the limit of the conscious grammar for our best students. This is a daunting requirement. I'm going to take a few moments and give you another way of saying this because I think it's an overwhelmingly important point. And I'm going to put something on the board here that will make most of you very nervous. And I apologize in advance. Try not to panic. Normal curve. Oh no, statistics. I, it's, no, it's going to be okay. Now for both of you who remember statistics class, this is the mean, the average, and we can talk about standard deviations. Calm down, it's going to be right. We think that the statisticians tell us that about two-thirds of the population is within one standard deviation of the mean, and about 98% are two standard deviations. Let me tell you about me and mathematics. I'm what is known as a good math learner. Math, I'm about here. I was in the very first advanced placement calculus class taught in an American high school. Isn't that exciting? Wow. Yeah, it was cool. I loved it. It was in 1958 in the suburb of Chicago. It was great. And uh, I went out to college and took more math. I majored in math for a while. I took calculus all the way through, I took advanced calculus, I took differential equations, I took abstract algebra, I took matrix algebra. And I, I still, my son is a mathematician. He's a professor of mathematics, and so is his wife. And my boy and I have been discussing math for the last 30 years. It is so cool what mathematicians <laughs> do. And I see stuff like this in papers. And stuff like this, and I know what it means. <laughs> it doesn't bother me. No, okay, it's fine. It's just ordinary. I'm sure I could teach the whole first year of statistics without any notes. I could prepare a little and do the second year, and it'd be fine. Are, are you impressed? Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Now, I'm a good math student, but <clears throat> sometimes I try to get advice on statistics from people who are specialists out here. I never understand anything they say. Does that make you feel better? I'll go to a statistician. I'll say, you know, I got 99% in this column, 1% in this column. Do you think they're significantly different? And they'll give me this answer where I know all the individual words, but I still don't know what they're talking about. Say, so, well, you've got to consider the homogeneity variance and regression of the mean, blah, 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 and the beta function of the Let's do that again. You know, and I never understand them. At home, I have collections, shelves and shelves of statistics books. In each book that I've kept, I've given a lot of them away because they're hopeless, um, in each book that I keep, there are at least a few pages that are comprehensible. <laughs> each book, like if I need to know about chi-square, you know, three by two table, what's the degree of freedom, I know which book to look at. And I know which page, because that will give me the answer. Most of the others, it's kind of like the guy who asks the time, and the other person starts telling him the history of the wristwatch. You know, this is what you know statisticians do. These are the people teaching the classes. Got it? These are the people who write the textbooks. And they are a lunatic fringe. <laughs> they are unable to make it comprehensible to real people because it's so ordinary to them. 
It's so much part of their life, they can't unpack it. In language, this is us. We are the problem. We are the limiting fringe. Some of you went into language education for the same reason I did. I like language. I like grammar. Not only do I like grammar, I love grammar. Not only do I love grammar, that whenever I'm speaking another language, and I'm consciously monitoring and I get something right, it's a thrill. <laughs> I'll, every time, I'll never forget learning the rule consciously for the agreement with the past, with French, and making the past participle agree with the direct object when the direct object comes before. Like in French, you don't say la chose que j'ai pris, you say la chose que j'ai pris. It's kind of leaving the language and maybe speakers get it wrong. They get it right. People say, oh, yes. <laughs> I rekindle the victory. What people like us forget is that normal people get their pleasures elsewhere. <laughs> not only do we like the rules, not only do we know the rules, but we keep teaching them. And every time we teach them, they get more and more obvious. We are the problem. For our best, best students, simple, straightforward rules like regular past, third person singular, they have no trouble with that. But even our good students, things like, you know, the past conditionals and the present continuous, they're kind of vague. Even our really analytic thinking, hard working students, we are the problem. This condition is extremely difficult to meet. Number two, now you have to know the rule. You have to be focused on form. You have to be thinking about rules. Now, the grammar experts, people who propose grammar-based curriculum, and they're still in the majority, feel that everybody in the world should be focused on form 24 hours a day, seven days a week. For them, this is what life is about, focusing on form constantly. Uh, what they do not understand is that normal people don't do this. Normal people, for some strange reason, are interested in understanding what people tell them, interested in understanding what they read, and interested in communicating ideas. And this idea of constantly thinking about rules all the time is foreign to the average person. Third, you got to have time. It takes time to dredge up these rules and apply them. The studies show that if you start monitoring your language, you'll slow down about 30%. And you slow down by inserting a little more silence between your phrases and words, about 30%. What I'm doing now is putting about 30% of silence between my words and phrases, and it's kind of irritating to listen to, isn't it? This is the price you pay. Our studies in the 70s, and you can read my Cure for Insomnia book if you want to see all this, we have found that the only time People do this, real people in the real world, that they know the rule, focus on form, and have time to apply the rule, is when we give them grammar tests. Got that? Grammar is used on grammar tests, and not much else. Very little. A few places that can help you here and there, but it's not something we should be doing all the time. Okay, now, if acquisition is the main thing, if learning is peripheral, the issue then becomes how do we acquire language? Let me begin the discussion by making an outrageous statement. In my opinion, we all acquire language the same way. The reason this is an outrageous thing to say is that we understand individual variation. Those of us who dealt with students know that in groups that seem to be very homogeneous, there's a lot of variation in people. Different ideas, different interests, different ways of doing things. Nevertheless, there are some things we all do the same. Let me give you some examples. Digestion. We all digest food the same. No significant individual variation. First you put it in your mouth, down your throat, into your stomach. That's how it's done everywhere. That's how it's done in Busan and Seoul, all the way, all the way through the country. The visual system is the same everywhere. It's always the occipital lobe in the back of the brain. It's never in the side of the brain. It's never in the front of the brain. It's never in the elbow. It's true in North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, wherever you go. Uh, I'm going to, instead of telling you how language is acquired, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes 
and do some sample language lessons with you. But uh, I need your permission. Is that okay? Sure. I'm enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what just happened. People over there thought it was a good idea. Not much reaction from right here, <laughs> except for Patrick, who has seen it before on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> what goes through What goes through your mind when you're sitting here in a group with your colleagues around, and this visiting expert comes in and says, "Language lesson," and comes to where you're sitting? What goes through your mind? Fear. Fear. <laughs> He's going to call on me. I'm going to have to say something. I'll make a mistake. I'll be humiliated. <laughs> Think about this. Who are you? Professional educators. And yet the idea of a language lesson in public makes you at least a little bit nervous. What does this mean? In my opinion, it means we're doing something fundamentally wrong, something fundamentally unnatural, the way we teach language. It's not your fault. I would feel exactly the same way. I'm going to give you the lessons anyway. I'm going to go back up here to do it. Uh, I'll use a language you've heard before, and maybe some of you speak. And I'll give you two lessons, and you can tell me which one you like better. Here's lesson number one. Wir werden jetzt anfangen, Deutsch zu lernen. Und ich möchte in Voraus sagen, dass nach meiner Meinung Deutsch ist eine sehr schöne Sprache. Und ich hoffe, dass Sie alle sehr viel Erfolg mit Deutsch haben werden. What do you think? Good lesson so far? You think if I kept talking like that, you'd pick up German? How about if I repeated it? How about if I said it louder? Said it louder, right? Okay. Slower. Slower. Anybody speak German here? Well, if there were German speakers, they would tell you that's pretty slow. Okay, that wasn't the problem. How about if I wrote it on the board? I know. I'll write it on the board. I'll erase every fifth word, and you guess what the word is. <laughs> None of those things mean anything. We can scramble the sentences, but none of those things mean anything. And you can see that now. Here's lesson number two. Das ist meine Hand. Verstehen Sie das? Hand? Ja? Sagen Sie ja. Ja. Das ist mein Kopf. Kopf. Verstehen Sie Kopf? Ja? Also Kopf. Kopf. Ist gut, ja? Ja. Hier ist Mr. Spock. <lacht> das ist Bach hat zwei Ohren. Zwei Ohren. Eins, zwei, zwei Ohren. Ja? Also, verstehen Sie das? Verstehen Sie das? Ja. Ja, ja gut. Also, das ist Bach, ja. Augen. Verstehen Sie Augen? Ja? ja. Wie viele Augen? Eins, zwei, drei Augen. <lacht> Ist das richtig? Drei Augen? Nein. Nein. Wir haben nur zwei Augen. Ja, zwei Augen. Mund. Verstehen Sie Mund? Und hier ist eine Zigarette, ja? Nein, nein, Entschuldigung. Zigaretten sind nicht gut, ja? Um, if you understood language lesson number two, I did everything necessary to teach you German. I will now share with you the most important concept I have learned about language, the best kept secret in the profession. We acquire language in one way and only one way, when we understand it. That's it. We don't acquire language when we produce it. We don't acquire language when we get our errors corrected. We don't acquire language when we understand grammatical rules. We acquire language when we understand what people tell us, not how they say it, but what they say. Speaking a language is the result of getting comprehensible input, not the cause. So conversation classes where we encourage people to talk more, talk more, talk more, not getting anywhere. It's the input that causes language acquisition to happen. Well, one more hypothesis and we can jump to the hard part, which is application. Um, Affective variables. We know from our research, other people's studies, motivation counts, common sense. Self-esteem, self-confidence, okay? But this is more self-esteem, you better. And third, anxiety. And for anxiety, the correlations are negative. 
the lower the anxiety, the better the language acquisition. In fact, my hypothesis is for language acquisition to really proceed optimally, anxiety should be zero. This has happened to you. Have you ever been in a conversation, speaking a language you don't speak very well, where the conversation gets so interesting, you temporarily forget that you're dealing with another language, or you're involved in the book, you're so lost in the book, you're barely aware what language it's in. When that happens, that's when you're acquiring. That's the idea. It's the opposite of this focus on the form stuff. Focus on the message. Here's how we put it into the theory. Chomsky tells us somewhere in the brain is a language acquisition to the device. Our job, get input into the device. Low motivation, low self-esteem, high anxiety. The block goes up, and the input cannot get in. This explains how we can have two students in the same class, both understanding one makes better progress than the other. One is open to the input, the other is closed. Let me now summarize everything I've said in the last 25 minutes, and I'll summarize it in one sentence. I wonder why it took me so long. We acquire language in one way, when we get comprehensible input in a low anxiety uh, situation. That's the theory. Let me state the problem of language teaching this way. We've done the hard part, or we've done the easy part. Let me rephrase that. It's certainly the easy part. What we've shown in theory is that we want input that's interesting and comprehensible, and language acquisition happens. This is hard to do. In classes in school, we're very good at giving people input that is comprehensible, but not very interesting. That's school. The outside world is very good at giving people input that's interesting, but not very comprehensible if you're a low-level language buyer. My colleagues at the university spend most of their time presenting us with input that is neither interesting nor comprehensible, in my opinion. Um, if this is true, though, if this comprehensible input is true, what does it mean for classes? Do we need classes? Oh, yes. Classes are fabulous. I'm in favor of language classes. Classes will give you the input that the outside world will not. I mean, I could hang out. I've been in Korea now for nearly a week in my life. I've been here two weeks. And all I picked up is Kamsahamida. That's not it. Um, and Anatal said kimchi. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's it. Because the input is incomprehensible. One ten minutes of a good Korean class, I would get so much more. The class will give you the input that the outside world will give you very, very reluctantly. Okay. So classes are terrific. I'm all for them. Uh, at the elementary level, we've had very good success with classes that are filled with comprehensible input. Methods such as TPR, Total Physical Response, you've heard of. Asher, great stuff. Asher, really pioneer. He had all these ideas before I did. So did a lot of other people. And he was there first. Uh, after that, uh, natural approach, Tracy Carroll, my old buddy. Uh, after, now it's TPRS. Uh, your homework assignment is to Google TPRS. I think they're really interesting. They're doing great things. I love going to their conferences and taking their classes in languages. They usually take beginning Mandarin and intermediate Spanish. It's so much fun. The teachers are so good. What these methods have in common is they fill the classroom with comprehensible input, and they're organized. You don't just go in and start talking. But they're not organized around points of grammar. They're organized around topics that those students will find interesting and comprehensible. We don't need to focus on grammar because if you give people enough comprehensible input, the grammar is there. We do a little bit of conscious grammar teaching, not much. That's for editing, little places where your version of the language disappears from the standard. My particular problem is this one. I'm one of 30% of the population that hasn't acquired this. So I think of the rule when I get it right. It's for little stuff like that where you know, your, your version disappears, disappears, disagrees with the standard. Um, our research shows us that these methods do very, very well. Published research in professional journals, we have never lost. When we compare our methods to traditional methods, they're always better. 
When the test is communicative, our kids do a lot better. When the test is grammar, students in these classes are either the same or slightly better than the grammar students. And they're more inclined to continue studying. They like it more. Well, these methods are fine, but they're not enough. We don't just want what these methods give us. These methods give us conversational, everyday language. We want more. We want what Jim Cummins from Canada calls the academic language, the language of business, the language of science, the language of politics. We want the kids to have enough English to read all Steve Krashen's books. Okay, these are the original. These things are very important. Well, how do we get academic language? I'm going to recommend two ways. One way is going on now in your classes, I'm sure. And that's content-based language teaching. Uh, teaching content, we call it sheltered subject matter teaching, where the students get English culture, literature, history, taught in a comprehensible, compelling, exciting way. And they not only get subject matter, they get language, and it's academic language. There's another way of getting academic language. And you know what? I think it's the only way to really do it. I've come to the conclusion that there's really just one way to get academic language. It's the way it has always happened. And just to raise the tension and suspense, no one, not a single person on this planet, has ever developed academic language by studying it, by doing vocabulary lists, grammar, etc. It has never happened. In other words, I'm saying the entire field of English for academic purposes is wrong about that. And I'm going to present you with a much easier way, the way everybody has done it, the way you did it. It's using one magic technique that is rarely used in our programs. It's called reading. <laughs> and there's one kind of reading that's more powerful than any other. And it's the kind of reading most of you did last night before you fell asleep. The kind of reading that really counts is free, voluntary reading. Reading because you want to. No book report, no questions at the end of the chapter. You don't like the book, you put it down and pick up another one. Today I'm going to tell you no idea that the path, the route to academic language consists of two steps. And you all went through them. The first step is extensive, light, self-selected, pleasure reading. You guys, most of you did this as when you were adolescents. When your mom calls up and says, are the lights out, and you're under the blanket with a flashlight reading a novel. That's where it happened. The second is through academic reading that you select because you are interested in the topic. I want to give you a case history before I show you some of the data. And it's the case history I know the best, and it's me. I'm going to tell you about me because, not because I'm different, but because I think we're the same. I think we went through the same process. I want to tell you about my process, and I think it works for first and second language, and how I went through stage one and stage two, and so did you. Stage one for me began in middle school age, around nine or ten years old, when I first became a pleasure reader. And my first form of pleasure reading was comic books. Massive amount of comic. How many of you were ever comic book readers? Yeah, OK. There you go. Good. Comic books, comic books, that's all we did. Now, I had a disadvantage because I was reading these in the 40s and 50s. And the silver age of comic books, Stan Lee and Marvel Comics, didn't begin until 1961. So it was a little, I had only Batman and Superman which were not nearly as interesting as the Marvel Comics characters. But boy, it was good enough for us, and I read massive amounts of comic books in those days. My father supported my comic book habit, which was very nice. Second, I got into sports stories after comic books. Uh, when I started high school, I read baseball stories. Um, my favorite author, telling you this for a reason, was a guy named John Artunis. I tell you about John Artunis. I was I've been discussing this with a guy named Jim Trelease, the author of the Read Aloud Handbook, who is one of our best friends in language education. Let me tell you, Trelease is amazing. His favorite author when he was a kid was John Artunis. 
John Cartoon has written about 20 novels, all based on a mythical baseball team, the Brooklyn Dodgers, but he changed the names of the characters. 20 of them, can you imagine? I reread a couple of them recently, they're just as good. It wasn't all about double plays and home runs. It was about the lives of the players, their frustrations, their successes, their failures, coming back after defeat, all this. Wow, I'll tell you about the last one. Number 20 in the series was called World Series. I'll tell you about the last chapter, the seventh game of the World Series. Last of the ninth, the score is 4-3. Two out, bases loaded. The pitcher is the father. The batter is the son. They haven't spoken for 15 years. <laughs> now that's writing. Let me tell you, you'll have to read it yourself to find out what happened. Okay. After uh, sports stories, and what I'm focusing on here is when I did comics, I read narrowly. I didn't read every comic book. I read superhero comic books. Okay. And in sports reading, I focused on a few authors. John Artunas was the main one. There were a few more that wrote in a similar style. I didn't try to cover a lot. After that, it was science fiction. In those days, it was Robert Heinlein, it was Arthur C. Clarke, it was Ray Bradbury. These are the authors that I that I grew up with, okay? And I read everything they wrote. They read lots and lots of, Isaac Asimov wrote 300 books, okay? He's probably writing from the other side right now. <laughs> Asimov was interviewed, I saw an interview on TV, and the interviewer says, well, what do you do all day? He says, well, I write all day, and I'd rather be doing this than talking to you. That's <laughs> great. Uh, and the books were fantastic. This was my curriculum. This was my curriculum in high school. This is what made me literate. I don't remember anything from school. <laughs> my colleague, Alfie Cohn, I love what he said about high school. He says, I paid attention to everything except the teachers. <laughs> right? So I read books in high school, but I don't remember them. I could tell you the titles of A, you have no idea what they were about. I passed tests on them, I have no idea. I remember these, I'll tell you that. These books did not bring me to the highest level of literacy. They are the bridge between conversation and academic. There have been discourse studies, my old buddy Doug Biber has done a few, um, where you look at the discourse of conversation and heavy academic, which is abstracts of physics papers, okay? And uh, the minute you get into comics, it's significantly more complicated than conversation. The vocabulary is harder, the grammar is harder. Fiction that comes around here. Science fiction is the most complex. Isn't that nice? I found out about that. But as you see, this is a bridge. It makes academic reading comprehensible. It doesn't do it, but it's the missing link. Academic work for me, academic reading didn't really start with graduate school. Again, undergraduate, I don't remember very much. I spent a lot of time playing the piano, playing pool, and lifting weights, which I thought was a good, well-rounded curriculum. <laughs> uh, and bowling, yeah, I remember that. Uh, but I, and I do remember books and classes like high school, but I couldn't tell you what they were about. I caught fire in graduate school. Graduate school, I discovered linguistics. I enrolled in a linguistics program, and it soon was clear to me that if you want to understand linguistic theory, you must read Noam Chomsky. Even though it wasn't assigned, I read the complete works. I started with 1957, as early as monographs and tactic structures, worked through the current issues of linguistic theory, and aspects of the theory of syntax, it was never assigned, but once I did that, everything, all the mysteries cleared up. And it was comprehensible because I did it chronologically. It was like a story. It was a novel. It was compelling. There would be a problem. He'd solve problems in 1957, but there'd be some left over. And then he'd clear those up in 1963, and then new ones in 1965, etc. And I absorbed Chomsky's way of thinking, how scientists think. I got scientific method from Chomsky. I don't know Noam Chomsky. I was introduced to him once. I said, I'm Steve Krashen. He said, who? Anyway, uh, but I do owe him having learned scientific method. After I did uh, syntactic theory, I eventually did my dissertation in left-right brain differences 
And the technique we used was this. It's called dichotic listening. You hook someone up with headsets, and they hear one stimulus in this ear, and another stimulus in that ear, and I'll play this ear will hear ba, and this one will hear ga, and the person tells you what they heard. And if the left, if the right ear does better, they're more inclined to report the right ear. The left side is doing the processing, the other ear, the other side. Well, the technique was very good for determining what's on each side of the brain. And it turned out that the, war, the technique was pioneered by a Canadian scholar named Doreen Kimura. So I read everything by Doreen Kimura. I found about 40 papers she had done over the last 30 years using this technique and related ones. I read them all. Now in psychology, the papers are three pages, so it's not that big a deal. Uh, and I read what her colleagues did. She taught me experimental design. She taught me how to use statistics and experiment subjects, how they're set up, how studies are set up. I wasn't trying to learn academic language. I was interested in how the experiment would come out, what the problems were, what her critics would say, how she would respond to them, and doing it chronologically, it was an adventure. I've used this throughout my academic career. I still do it. When I start something new, I start at the beginning. And it's exciting. It's a drama. It's like reading a biography, an intellectual biography. Uh, what these two steps have in common, number one, it's selective reading. It's narrow reading that gradually expands. Number two, it's incredibly compelling and interesting. I determined the questions I wanted to read about. Nobody else. We're all different. We're all going to have different areas that we want to read about. Okay. My area, my path was particular to me, but the methodology was the same, and I never studied academic language. But when it was time to start writing journal papers, I sat down with my advisor and other students we'd been working with, and the, my uh, teacher, Peter Ladefeld, would say, well, this goes here, that goes there. I said, yeah, that's right, yeah. Because I had read all the papers. I had absorbed it, I had acquired it. It cannot be taught. There's no way on earth Look at vocabulary. The average educated speaker of English, native speaker, knows between 50 and 150,000 words. That's not 150,000 trips to the dictionary, 150,000 you know, exercises, draw a line from the word to the definition. There aren't enough hours in the day. We pick up vocabulary by reading. Each time you see a word in print, you get a tiny, tiny little bit. But if you read enough, that's more than enough. We've done studies on second language, and the same process is true as well. Each time a second language person sees an English word in print, you get a little bit of the meaning. We're starting to see some vocabulary studies now of the vocabulary size of second language inquirers. Beatrice you no, know, Victoria Rodrigo, a former student, did a study of people who knew Spanish first and second, and she found that educated second language users of Spanish who've read have larger vocabularies than a lot of native speakers. I know for sure that those of you in this room who speak English as a second language have larger vocabularies in English than George W. Bush. <laughs> There's not a doubt in my mind, okay? It comes from reading. It's the only way. The rage now is genre analysis, discourse styles, corporate analyses, and all this, which I regard as very fine linguistics, but completely irrelevant to language pedagogy. You know, they'll be, I'll give you an example. I'm reading the work of John Swales lately. John Swales is a very hard worker, and uh, all his pals do the same. Ken Hyland, they all do the same kind of research. And again, it's painstakingly slow. And I know it's brilliant research. All they've shown is that nobody could possibly learn this stuff. For example, Swales has about two big chapters and about four articles on abstracts in scientific papers. And every one is more complicated than the one before. And he keeps making mistakes, and his colleagues don't agree. Uh, Ken Highland has four papers on the word quite. Like, that's quite enough. You know, or I'm quite tired. And you, if, you're, if you've read a lot, you know that's true, what he's saying. But you can't determine the rules. Everyone disagrees. What they've shown is that it can't be taught. 
And the minute every new paper comes out, we try to teach it, put it in the materials. It is absolutely hopeless. We also have study after study that shows that people who read more have better vocabularies, have better grammar, know more about the world, write better, read better, etc. Which I won't go through all the studies. I want to make one more comment and then stop for questions because I know some of you have to leave. I want to make a uh, addendum to all this by briefly talking about writing. What's writing for? Writing is output. How about that? That's a surprise, isn't it? Writing is output. We acquire language by input. This predicts that people who write more will not necessarily write better. And they don't. I've looked at the research on this. It's true. More writing does not mean better writing. Because we don't acquire language by writing, we acquire language by reading. If we grade people on their writing ability according to style, syntactic form, vocabulary, coherence, we're really grading reading. Because someone who reads a lot is automatically going to write well. Those of you in this room, if I were to ask you to write something now, I won't, don't worry. And we have them evaluated, and let's say there are 23 people in the room, I don't know, I just made that up, uh, there'd be 23 good papers. There would be a bad one in the room. Anything you write is going to come out fine. You can't help it. You've read too much. It's part of you. Your writing style is acquired, not learned. That means it's stored deep in your central nervous system. You cannot write poorly. You don't even know how. The only way you can write poorly is if you've just read a pile of student papers. Okay? <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to come out just beautifully. You go to someone's house, there are books everywhere. You'd be amazed to see a sample of their writing with, with serious mistakes. So writing does not cause better writing. Writing does something else. Some of you are writing right now. The odds are very good that no one else is going to read what you're now writing. Probably not even you. <laughs> but, but it helps, doesn't it? You bet it helps. Writing takes your ideas, you put them down on the page, they're vague, you write them down, they get clearer. Writing gives you better ideas. Writing helps problem solving. 